happening. Hello. Hello, hello, Intern V. How are you? I'm good. How Zozo. are you? <laughs> Zozo. Zozo, let me not call you Intern V. Zozo. Right. <laughs> yeah. Long so, shot, Renan. I'm good. I'm good, Gwags. <laughs> so I've It's been, a chat, man. I've been thinking about what I'm, am I going to say, Uwandile, or am I going to say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I was also thinking, should I be professional? What are we doing here? But let's have this conversation. Uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be oh, great. Buddy, it's great connecting with you and seeing your face. Oh my God. I, haven't, I feel like I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> yeah, we haven't touched base in a while. I think it's been like, what, two years, three years, if I'm not mistaken. It's crazy. Yes. But man, yeah. it's, it's good having you. And thank you so much for being so open to chatting with me today. So just yeah. quick, quick intros, uh, we're still waiting for a few people to join, but quick intros about Ugwandile, guys. Um, I've known Ukwax, I'm just going to call him Ukwax. Because, <laughs> yeah, that's just yeah. how deep this thing goes. Um, I've known Ukwax for years, man. We've known each other since high school, um, since we were nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Since high school. And um, I think... Over the years, I mean, we all move on, right? We all do different things. But I think the power of social media has kept us together and kept us bigging each other up and giving each other thumbs up on the things that we're doing, which is fantastic. Um, yeah. Speaking about that, um, so, Quax, you started uh, Davidson Book Club. When yeah, did that yeah. Off again? Okay, so, firstly, um, so my face is frozen on my end. Can you see me? Am I moving? I can, and I can see you. You're moving here and there. I think oh, the connection okay. drops sometimes, but otherwise, okay. yeah, none. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Yeah. and so, I can hear you uh, properly. I can hear you just fine, okay. so you can just turn on. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, uh, a Davidson Book Club started in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, 2015. And so, so as you know, um, we were privileged enough to go to certain schools uh, that afforded us an opportunity to know and learn things outside of what was happening in the communities that we lived in, right? Yeah. So after matric, I um, went into law school and I realized that um, there's a greater challenge when it comes to our education system um, that needs to be talked about because we weren't having conversations about that. Yeah. And when I got to varsity, I started to realize that Yes, in varsity, everyone is competing at the same level, but the playing field to get there is not level. Mm. So how, how, how does a Kwandile who's young, doesn't understand where to start in this whole thing, embark on this journey to interrogate that big conversation about the education system? And if we can have these parallel education systems uh, exist in South Africa and have a sustainable future that we develop. And by that, I mean, we've got private schools that do and run their uh, whole thing in a, in a certain way. And then we have these schools in townships and so on that still don't have access to libraries. I mean, at the time we started, Zozo, only 14% of schools in South Africa have libraries, right? Which is crazy. It's crazy, and nobody is talking about that. Yeah. So when we started out, I mean, we went door to door uh, and asked for books. As you know, the books do exist in townships, but we use it as decorations, and it's a weird thing. Yeah. So we went door to door uh, asking for books, ended up with a trolley full of books just from Davidson, and then somehow Reedy Tlabi from 702 picked up on the story. She did a whole campaign with us, we ended up with over 2 million books that we then distributed across the country in establishing libraries. We established 14 libraries, and two of those libraries were privileged enough to establish them on TV with Zola, mm. which was a great thing because it then afforded us an opportunity to engage bigger partners. Mm. Uh, it then afforded us to do your Kai FM with Kai FM. We were engaging with the mayor. We were, we were engaging with the minister of education, Enji Mutsecha. We are engaging with all of these partners that I think today where we are and the positioning we have in societies, it's because of those conversations that started with Ridi Tlabi and then ended up with us having these 14 libraries. Yeah. But also that was um, a passion project. 
And with yeah. passion projects, sometimes, um, you know, reality hits. Then you start to realize that uh, this has to be sustainable. You have to develop a model that's going to work for you, that's going to pay you, and also ensure that there's sustainability long before you're gone. Then we realized that the way that we were doing things and the things that we're trying to champion for, it wasn't sustainable and that model wasn't working for us. And that's when we transitioned to Rudo Institute. But yeah, so Davidson would do that. So every month we would do, would have an author would come by and just talk about their book. But moreover, we have like motivational speakers because we wanted to, to integrate a lot of things into one. So if we were talking about a book that uh, relayed a message around um, depression, anxiety, mental health, will then have someone uh, like a psychologist will come and speak about the impact of, say, for instance, COVID-19 on societies like Davidson. Yeah. And then would have a conversation around the book, the psychologist and their information. And we as a community, how we relate to all of these complex things at the same time. So that was great. And it was successful for some time. But then it wasn't sustainable. I mean, for five years, Zozo, we ran that whole thing, not registering a single cent. So Sarah... So Sarah, so Sarah was working and half her salary would be reinvested into the whole initiative. And I took like odd jobs uh, just to finance the whole thing. Um, but because we knew and understood what we were doing and we were playing the long game, we also understood that we need to sacrifice certain luxuries for the big idea. And I think yeah. today we'll be talking about the big idea and where we are with the big idea and uh, how far we're going to take this whole thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Just before we carry on, can I ask you to tilt your phone up just a little bit? Like, I'm seeing you right till here. <laughs> okay, yes. Is that fine? Yes, perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, I'm glad you touched on the transition of E. Davidson Book Club to Rudo Institute because I was actually going to ask you about that because I know Davidson Book Club in a different space, obviously. And now yeah. I'm seeing Rudo Institute. So I, I quite did want to know about why you guys transitioned and where the loopholes and the gaps were. So I'm glad that you touched on that. Um, but beyond, beyond um, David Twin Book Club, we now have Rudo Institute. We're talking about higher education. How has the transition been? Um, has it been worth it? Do you guys see the, the future you have envisioned for Rudo Institute? Are you actually moving those cogwheels? Yeah. So, um, as I said, Dave Tone Book Club wasn't sustainable at all. Uh, Sarah and I had an honest conversation with ourselves. So, I mean, I, I self-diagnosed. Um, uh, I thought I had depression uh, in 2018. I was going through a rough patch. Both Sarah and I were going through a rough patch. Uh, we self-diagnosed ourselves. <laughs> but uh, after that conversation we then decided that we need to interrogate what we're doing and basically develop a model that's going to help us uh, find ways to run this whole thing. Um, but also we were really scared, uh, yeah. to be honest. When we started Davidson Book Club, I mean, yes, we had the idea, but also we understood that what we're trying to do is beyond us. Mm. We were too young, too broke, and too inexperienced to play in the space that we were playing in. And very ambitious and, about it as well, and, I must and, say. And very, and very ambitious. And to a certain extent, um, it was a, a sense of um, the arrogance to say uh, a, a person as young as, I mean, I think when Sarah started, I think she was like 21. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about building a university. She was 21. I think I was 24 at the time. Yeah. So... And we're just going on and on and on about how successful we are in building this whole thing, not realizing actually the steps that needed to be taken, right? Yeah. But now that we are in the space, so Dave, if it wasn't for Davidson Book Club, I don't think we would ever be where we are today. We learned everything we could. Um, we got the contacts. We got the mentors when we were doing Davidson Book Club. And the transition was, I would say, with ease, right? Mm. So I did a TED talk, I think in 2016, mm -hmm. 17, 17, 2017, met a guy there, an architect. So in my TED talk, I talked about the end goal would be building a university of our own. Man? Mm -hmm. And at the time, I was already working with the city of Ekuruleni 
to work towards building a university which will focus on science and technology in the city. Mm. But so these were two conversations. So I did want to work with the city, but also I also wanted to do my own thing at the same time. So when I realized that what was happening with the city was taking a bit of time and it was getting too political for my liking at the same time, mm. I then decided to excuse myself from that particular space and then focus solely on Rudo Institute and working with Sarah on that. So when I did the TED talk, I met a guy who's an architect. He was like, hey, man, I believe in your vision. If ever you need to do anything that needs my skills and expertise, I'm willing to do it for free. And we were like, yo, we want to build a university. He was like, he's on board. He called all of his friends and colleagues that could help at that particular time. We had a meeting. And that's what we were discussing since 2017. And then I met a couple of people also and then they were adding their influence to what we were doing and they were telling us what to do, giving us guidelines. And that worked for us. And then we got to a space to say, okay, now that we have a feasibility study, now we've developed all the frameworks, done all the research. Mm. Um, what do we do now to validate the work that we've done on paper? So we went on to start Rudo Institute. We offered training for free. So basically our business model at the moment is that we go and source sponsors then sponsors fund the programs that we run. And then the students who are coming from Davidson and other townships get to experience Rudo Institute and get the education at no cost, right? Yeah. So because we're going to talk about the, the book that I wrote, yeah. um, that's our piece in making education free and accessible to those that are vulnerable and need it the most. But we'll talk yeah. about higher education and training um, later on in the conversation. Sure. So, so, yeah, so... So basically, that's what we're doing now. And we are at the first phase of building our own private university. We already have the accreditation. We already have the groundwork. I mean, we've trained like 2,000 students as is since we started yeah. last year in, in, in August. Um, and on that. that is amazing. That's really, really thank amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I mean, we've worked with quite a few uh, partners who are big in the space. I won't mention them because they're paying for ad. <laughs> uh, they're not paying for ad space. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so that was that. And I, I could gladly say that uh, at the pace that we're going, in the next five years, we should have already started building and the university is going to come alive. Um, I am very, very, very excited about the future and what we hope because next year, I think you will be seeing... Uh, different moves that we'll be making based on the ground we've been doing this year. Yeah. It's just that there was a lot of disruptions with COVID-19, but we are, Zozo, I want you one day when you drive into Davidson, you see the um, discovery offices in, in Santon. Yes. <laughs> that inspires me a lot. So basically the idea is to bring cutting edge designs and architecture into townships where people are, um, bring hope, inspire people so that when they look at that building, they can look at their own lives and their aspirations and they can say, okay, cool. If Kwandile could do this coming from where he comes from, I mean, you know me from way, way back when I was still yeah. selling sweets in high school. And so I want kids to think if this guy can, I mean, there's nothing special about me. It's just that I've been granted platforms that shaped my life. And I want to give that to other people, right? Yeah. Where they are, not needing to catch three, four taxis to send him to be able to yeah. access opportunities yeah. because that's nonsensical. That then creates the problems that we have right now where we have economical migrants who come from the Eastern Cape to access opportunities in Cape yeah. Town or in Joburg. And what we're finding is that we're having a lot of young people who have skills, expertise in one area and there's this congestion. And then that's when the unemployment, that's when all the other things, corruption, all the other things manifest themselves in our societies because opportunities are not brought where people are. So people have to migrate to where opportunities are. And that's the biggest problem we find in our societies today. So townships will continue to have the legacy that they have because we're not bringing these cutting edge um, platforms or mm. institutions or um, you know, opportunities yeah. into townships. So I think that needs yeah. to change because it's not like young people in townships don't want to do great. It's just like they're not associated to surrounded by all these things that are happening in the world. And we want to be um, one of the people that are driving that kind of change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
I think that is a really, really um, important movement. It really is. There's something beautiful about creating your own resource in the space that you're in. So that thing of having to now migrate to a different space with different location to find success, to find opportunity is a bit like oh, ancient, right? But we are still very yeah. much living in that time. Um, yeah. There are a lot of um, businesses coming up from the township businesses. I mean, we have the whole Casinomics as a concept now, right? Like yes, all yes. micro economies are existing in townships. I think we need to expand what that actually looks like right now. It shouldn't just be um, SMEs in a specific field or industry. It should really be in education, which is what you guys are doing right now. It should be in sports. Mm -hmm. It should be in arts. It should be you name it, you know, right? Um, in all those industries. Yeah. So I think there is beauty in creating those networks um, yeah. and creating networks that help each other thrive. Um, I think that's something yeah. that is really needed. Um, but touching on, you touched on the book a bit earlier on, and I think this is something that I'd really want us to touch on during this chat. So you came yeah. off um, the book about higher education. You reached out to a whole lot of people who are either in that space, who were, um, who had been through higher, like, taken up higher education um, and people who were still studying um, or working in that space. How did that yeah. come about? How did basically packaging that book help you understand the space a bit better? Yeah. So as I said, like 2018 was a very challenging year for me personally, uh, when we had to uh, close down Davidson Book Club and start developing models of yeah. developing a, a, a feasible um, alternative business. Uh, so what happened was I was supposed to go to the UN to deliver a speech on educational development in um, uh, developing countries, right? So, that. yeah, so it was supposed to be a policy suggestion or policy document that I then submitted to the UN um, and, and initially this whole book was supposed to be a speech, right? Okay. So initially I had written a speech that I would deliver at the UN and some of the things I was talking about, I had hoped, uh, the UN will take it on as policy suggestion and then they'll have a conversation with Cyril Ramaphosa about some of the things being included either in South African, in the South African educational landscape or since Sir Ramaphosa is the chair of the AU, then the, a, the, the, the AU will then consider some of the things that I talked about uh, to be part of sort of like the educational framework and funding, right? Yeah, on the because the it should be a bit bigger than SA. Yes. So um, what had happened was I couldn't raise enough money for me to go to the UN. So I was stuck with a speech. And I was asking myself, well, what do I do from here to continue to, to continue the work and also ensure that I give advice, I give ideas that could be explored so that our challenges could be in the next generation's successes, right? Yeah. Um, I met, luckily enough, I met Praveen Gordon just before, was it just before or just after he got sacked as finance minister? Uh, at a conference and we had a chat a brief chat i think it was like six ten minutes and i was talking to him about some of the things i'd written about in the speech and i was just asking his input if he thinks all of this could possibly happen and um he said i'm onto something i should drop him an email and we'll see how we take this because also he was well aware that he was going to leave the office of uh, minister of finance at the time and I sent him an email, didn't respond back. But I thought with that little conversation that we had, I think I'm sitting on gold and I think I need to work on this, um, try and find ways and means to get this work out there to the people that maybe will take it on either the shadow minister, because at the time I thought I'd give the book to um, Professor Bizzoli. Professor Bizzoli and I, uh, we're in talks via the university project in the city of Ekuruleni. So she's the shadow minister of higher education. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think Buti Manamela added me as well on Instagram. So we started having chats 
briefly about higher education and every now and then I'll just send him an email, send him uh, suggestions via in, uh, Instagram. And I thought, let me not use that platform. Uh, let me not talk about this thing on Instagram. Yeah. Let me develop a book that will then be submitted to them to consider. And that's how it all started. Um, and then I think I got, I got really, 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 um, there was a lot of pressure on me in that particular space because I thought I'd just write the book in like a month or two weeks, uh, finish it off, get it published. Cause I didn't know anything about the space till today. I'm still learning new things, you know? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't have physical copies in none of my libraries because I thought uh, everyone is on Amazon. Everyone will be able to buy the book. And I'm starting to realize not everyone is able to use that kind of medium yeah. to buy books and so on and so forth. Yeah. So anyway, I went to Swaziland. Um, when I got to Swaziland, I realized something so beautiful. I mean, in almost every community, a church would build its own school, right? Mm -hmm. And then I got to do research on how they do that. So what, what the pastor would do at the time, he would set up a budget and say, okay, this year our main focus is to build a library, so we'll contribute towards the church, but then there needs to be another, um, um, another maybe a budget that's allocated towards building that library. And then after a year, they'll build the library. It's not the greatest of buildings. It's not cutting edge, but they have libraries. They have yeah. these schools that are built by commu communities outside of government. Yeah. And then I came back, and then I listened to a story about how Grace Bible Church was built in Soweto. Yeah. How uh, the, the pastor would ask people to just buy bricks. And then I think they would go contribute money. Uh, and then that's how basically the model of building that church came about. And I was like, yo, I wonder if some of these things could be established or done in South Africa to be able to build a university. Yeah. And then I started doing my research because I also did two years of law. So I, I know quite a bit about um, constitutionalism and, you know, the responsibility that we have as a society and as a government to be able to build these instruments. So Section 29, Subsection 1B of the Constitution says that government should take reasonable measures in making sure that they create access to higher education and training, right? Yeah. And then... There was also a policy document uh, done by the UN in 1948, which talked about um, creating a model where people have access to higher education. Of course, this was not considering black people at the time because we had just legislated apartheid in South Africa. Um, but there's been a lot of these conversations. The Freedom Charter also talks about um, us having free education, um, and there's a lot of political talk and political conversations that were being had about this conversation. And then I asked myself, is South Africa ready to take that on? Then I started looking at things such as EPWP, the programs that they run, why they run those programs. It's because they're not trying to create jobs, right, with EPWP. Yeah. But what they're doing is they are trying to create um, opportunities for people to have hope, to be able to do something whilst they're waiting for a job, and so on, and continue through the work of the municipality, provinces, and government, and national government. So why not incorporate the money that's being, and it's billions, why not con in, in, incorporate the money of EPWP to universities so that instead of people having these short-term contracts, let them go into institution, study a full diploma degree so that when they enter the job market, they are able to access better opportunities. They can use their ideas to develop entrepreneurial projects in their communities. They can use those degrees to empower the societies that they come from and also the legacies of their families, yeah. right? Yeah. And then I, look at, I looked at NSS Trust, so basically, I developed a model around community trust and said, if Davidson has a community of over 500,000 people, if every person contributed one rand, right, extra to their bill, their municipality bill, then would have 500,000 circulating in, a community, in an economy for that particular community to take at least uh, 10 to 50 uh, students to university on a monthly basis. So imagine if every community could contribute 500,000 Rand 
uh, to that community trust on a monthly basis. Then in a year, how many students can we take to universities, right? And then I started to look at even how universities, so universities get grants, right? Yeah. So how they use these grants, most of the money is being spent on paying the lecturers, um, paying the university staff. And then I said, okay, since we're all migrating to fourth industrial revolution, why don't we pay these um, maybe unemployed graduates or professors a once-off fee to do a recording and then that recording gets uploaded into a university cloud or whatever the case may be so that if Uzozo is studying journalism, right? Journalism 101, maybe you're studying English. You go on that cloud, you subscribe, you watch that video, and then you're able to get that information that you would have gotten from the lectures maybe uh, on a semester sort of like basis. But yeah. we're not paying the lecturer on a monthly basis. We're paying them once of fee so that they are able to upload their information on the cloud. And then we have, we own that information. And then also there's an issue with universities. So if you write a dissertation today, right? No matter how beneficial it is to communities, universities own that information, which is very problematic because some of these dissertations can come back and fix the issues that we are faced with in societies today, right? Yeah, yeah. So if, if there was a power sharing of 50-50, so if you develop a dissertation that talks about a particular thing and you actually make whatever that you're considering, um, say for instance, I'll make an example. If you have ways of developing farming methods that could be used in townships, right? Maybe urban farming or so on. Yeah. Once you start making money, you share those profits with the university for universities to continue having bursary schemes, for universities to continue doing the work that they're doing. Then we'll develop a, so, um, a model which is sustainable and also it empower the people that are developing all these yeah. ideas to continue going forward. So it's not that money is not there for these kinds of things. It's just that how we are using our money and departments, they're not talking to each other. So Department of Arts and Culture has its own bursary and their own requirements, and they're not talking to the Department of Public Works, how they can merge and ensure that if you are a graduate of arts, right, mm -hmm. you talk to the opportunities that exist to public infrastructure so that if you want to own your warehouse or gallery at some point, these departments are talking to each other and they're facilitating opportunities for graduates to get into these spaces and start building their own businesses. Yeah. So it's all of that. And I mean, if we had a cohesive idea or a shared idea as a country to say, is education a pillar of development that we need to prioritize for the next five years. And most of our GDP needs to go into this to ensure that maybe a certain segment of our population gets educated. And then in the next five years, we focus maybe on the unemployment and creating jobs and so on and so forth. So that the cycle uh, can ensure that people go into education, but moreover, they go into finding these opportunities because there are a lot of people who are graduates. There are a lot of people that even went to study overseas that can't find employment today because Department of Education never had a conversation with Department of Trade and Industry yeah. about how they facilitate their budget to ensure that we talked to one shared idea that we have as a country. So those are some of the issues that I confront in uh, the book. I confront the constitution and the reform that needs to happen. I also confront the idea around the means test, right? Yeah. And the admission process. So sometimes, Zozo, it's not even about um, people wanting to study certain things and certain faculties are only uh, maybe accessed by certain individual. It's our means test, number one, mm. because it says that a family, a household, needs to be earning a certain amount of money to be considered to get the, the, the loan, right, yeah. for, for, for people to access education. But some households earn a bit much, a bit more than the money that they, because maybe there's 12 uncles living in one household. So if you combine the whole income that they're getting, that they're getting as a family, they get much more than the required amount for them to get these loans. But 
all of yeah. these uncles have their own children, have their own responsibility. So they're not necessarily using all of that money to contribute to the family trust or family fund. Yeah. So then that becomes problematic. And also the way that we deal with our admission criteria is very problematic because there are people, I'll make an example, uh, in Ekuruleni, mm. only 14% of our people have access to higher education and training. Right, mm. and then so we are talking about building an aerotropolis uh, where our whole economy is going to be focused around the airport. But how many people in Davidson know enough about the opportunities that exist within the aerotropolis? Right, yeah. and then also how many kids get educated about those particular things already in grade 10, 11, and 12 so that they pass with the required levels so that they can get into these spaces? Yeah. So most of them. Most of them only hear about these things at orientation day, universities and so on. And then they didn't pass enough. So they have to do a bridging course and then it becomes too expensive. And then when it becomes too expensive, they end up settling for maybe a teaching degree because they know they're going to get a Funza Lishaga or so on and so forth. That's going to pay with their stipends, blah, 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 because they're coming from families that are struggling. They end up becoming teachers and not necessarily contributing towards the economy that we're trying to build. And then it becomes an issue because now there's a skills migration as well. Everyone is going in this one direction and then there's a vacuum in these other uh, industries. And people coming outside of South Africa know about these opportunities. They are able to access these opportunities. That's why even today you find a certain group of people, they're accessing the township economy. Certain people are accessing opportunities within the aerotropolis and the economy around that. And there's not a lot of diversity in these spaces. Yeah. And diversity is harnessed. You don't just wake up one day and let's have diversity. Let's implement B, E, C, O, C. You have to harness all of these things. And if we are not willing to do the groundwork, then we, we're not going to be successful. And as I said earlier, our challenges need to be the next generation's successes. Yeah. And that's not going to happen if we aren't able to plan for the long term. Um, the problem with politicians is that they're in power for five years and they plan around that five years. But all of these issues are overlapping because there wasn't a greater... I'll talk about the National Development Plan today. We will not succeed in our plans to achieve what the National Development Plan uh, wants to achieve. Because every now and then, when we have a new president, they implement their own strategies. And when they implement their own strategies, they're not going back to the National Development Plan and what it says. And already in yeah. developing that whole document, how much money was spent on that? How much money was spent on researchers, developers, and this, that, and this, that, that could have went into establishing, that could have went into establishing a panel within universities, around people in economics, in, in, in finance, in law, in all of these things to say, okay, guys, because the government is paying for your fees, let's come together and organize a symposium. And then all of you that are, that are paid or maybe all of you that get bursary schemes from us, you will then be forced to develop your own national development plan because it's part of the criteria of getting funding. And then with that, we'll implement it and see how it works. So, so we're not doing that as a cut. Yeah. So, I mean, just driving back to the book and the ambitions that you had for the book and um, the challenges and problems that you just outlined. For me, it sounds like, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong here, there is just a huge lack of cohesion with all of yes. these um, strategies, the conversations, the programs that are around um there's yeah. just a lack of cohesion is that something because i remember when we when we touched on um your book and kind of like where it went after you published it you had said that um it was too soon for the book to come out you just felt like it was too soon for it to have the impact that you you envisioned it would have do you think yeah. we will i don't know by the grace of the universe and god and all of our ancestors do you think that in any time soon we will start seeing that change happening or that cohesion kind of start developing in in our systems yeah so i think that's going to happen um the youth of today 
are very educated, um, they're very innovative, and also they understand that um, if, we do, if we don't do something today, South Africa will lose the legacy that it has developed in the continent of being, um, you know, South Africa is, is very industrialized and there's, there's a lot of opportunities in this country. Mm. But if we don't do our bit today, um, it's, we, we, we're going to be walking into the, it will flow, it'll fall, fall away and it will be very difficult for our children and their children to, to carve out a way for themselves. Yeah. So I think it's going to work out. And another thing is that young people are talking more. So uh, thank God to social media. Uh, we are able to connect with people from different areas. Uh, we are able to share ideas from different areas. So I'm looking at this issue with COVID-19 today. Uh, young people are voicing out issues that they're faced with, uh, either it be through P PPE scandals. Young people are voicing out their issues when it comes to constitutionalism. Young people are voicing out issues of... Um, you know, like corruption and what the country needs to do in order for it to uh, survive uh, yeah. what's happening right now in South Africa. So young people are talking and I think uh, it's going to be very interesting in the next few years because I see, I foresee young people getting to spaces of power. I foresee young people developing um, their own uh, political spaces to interrogate some of the already established political um, um, platforms uh, if they are not doing or voicing out things that we want um, to happen in this country. So I think it's, it's going to happen. It's just going to take a bit of time. And also sometimes systems, uh, I'll just make an example with like starting your own political party. It's a bit expensive. So chances are it's older people that will start political parties that have had some kind of experience, had worked, have saved a bit of money. So that alone makes it very hard for young people to just start a political party yeah. uh, and, and, and run a whole campaign to become a president. Yeah. So but the, all of those things are going to change. I mean, now the IEC is also changing the way uh, that it does its, its, its things. And you can now, as an independent um, go from provincial to national, which was something that you couldn't do before. So, so it's, it's going to be interesting. Young people are talking, they're educated, and they are confronting these things like, like nobody's business. So I'm very excited with the, the space that we're getting into as young people. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, I mean, before we wrap it up, I mean, we've had a very lengthy, deep chat about higher education <laughs> and all the likes, right? Um, but very, very light question, my friend. What are you reading right now? So, I'm reading uh, Dare Not Linger. Ne? So, okay. so, I got this book. Um, and it's going back to the whole thing. Uh, you know, there was a time when they were saying, ah, Nelson Mandela is a sellout, blah, blah, blah. I so, I actually... So many, like, open tabs about the Mandela, Madiba um, concept. Yeah. I'm always researching it. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... So with that as well, I, I, cause I, I never want to take information from other people and take it as that. So yeah. I always want to do my own research and find out what's going on. So the reason why I'm reading this book is just to find out um, what's happening. What's, what's with this whole thing with the legacy of Udata Mandela yeah. and also try and understand what was happening in his administration because I'm a huge fan of Tabombegi and I've done a lot of research on him but I never paid much attention to Nelson Mandela's time. Maybe I was too young also to understand what was going on. Uh, but right now, that's what I'm reading. And I'm just trying to find out what happened with the RTP policy, what was happening around that time, why political freedom before economic freedom, um, couldn't we uh, negotiate a, a better deal for ourselves? Um, was there an option for that? Uh, was he just buying time? Um, did yeah. he maybe get into the conversation with the sunset clause, understanding that there will be capacity that will be developed in the young people and young people one day would be like your Julius Malema who will try and interrogate things and be fearless in his approach to, for us as, as, as young people to find expression. And so I'm just busy trying to do research on that. And yeah, that's what I'm reading. And it's very interesting. It's very interesting to understand how. 
I was just going to ask, who would you, if I'm interested in politics, what other books would you say I must read? What would you recommend? I, I would recommend um, um, things that could have that couldn't things that couldn't be said by Frank Chikani. I'm not sure if I, I said the right title. It's a, it's a great book. Uh, it goes in detail about governance issues, separation of power, um, understanding how to uh, play in the political space and some of the complexities around politics. So that's very great uh, to read. And also it, it touches on the, the United Democratic Movement and how we then uh, saw a whole thing with the ANC winning elections in 1996. So it talks about a lot of things and the history of South Africa. So I think that's a great book to read. But also, uh, there's, a, there's a book that I really, really love, Zozo, uh, by Brayton Beck. I think she's the um, Shadow Minister of Justice, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, Rule of Law. It's a very interesting book. Um, it, it makes the justice system, uh, for anyone who hasn't studied law, if you think maybe uh, this is not your kind of book because you don't have the knowledge or you don't understand some of the wording there, she simplifies law uh, so that even a layman can understand what's going on yeah. within the space of justice. So it's very interesting and how uh, the courts and institutions such, such as the public protector were used by politicians to sway certain decisions, uh, how some of the... So some of the projects were defunded and with that the public protector didn't have enough funds to continue investigations so it's a, a very interesting sort of like book to understand the power that politicians have and the responsibility that they have and if they don't use that power and responsibility where the country can possibly be if we don't take initiative and ask these hard questions of yeah. what's happening in South Africa, how can we make this better and what do we need to consider in the future so that we don't have the same problems in the, in the near future, yeah. Cool. Those sound great. Um, I'll probably put yeah. those out. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Please, before this live um, cuts us off, where can people find you? So uh, people can find me on social media, Kwandi Lesi Kosana, uh, on um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, or they can come to Davidson at our center in Rudo Institute. Uh, or they just follow that like, Rudo Institute on social media. Uh, but my name is Gwandi Ilem Sikosana. If you can't find me on social media, I'll definitely probably come to your country. Uh, I'll probably come to your province because I'm next. And I believe that I am going to play a significant role in the development of Africa. And if you can't find me, I'll definitely find you uh, because, yeah, uh, there's a lot of big things that are coming. and. Uh, you'll be seeing my face a lot. Um, yeah, I'm very confident in the in the future that I'm building for myself and the legacy around my name yeah. and and my surname. So I'm really really proud of uh, yeah what I, what I, what I, what is going to happen. I'm the prospective president, and people should watch out. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, yeah. It's been amazing to see your journey, Quax, uh, and definitely legacy is everything nowadays. I do believe yeah. that you will go far with Rudo Institute and the other projects that you're working on and also with Sarah as well. So big up yeah. to you guys on driving these projects with such passion and, and vigor. Um, yeah, I wish you all the best, buddy, and we will catch up. But I think for now, before yeah. we get cut off and this thing doesn't save, technology is not our best friend sometimes. Um, yeah. We'll say our goodbyes. Thank you to everybody who joined. Uh, we really appreciate it. And the, the, the live will be saved under my IGTV. So if anybody missed it, you can check it out there. Otherwise, thank you so much for tuning in. Sharp. Bye. 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 Bye.